Good evening, church. Welcome to worship. Tonight, we'll again close our service with Holden Evening Prayer, and we thank the Weitzels for leading us through that part of our worship this evening, and we thank Sandy for leading us in our opening hymn tonight. We're going to continue in our sermon series for Wednesday evenings uh, based on Joseph's words from the book of Genesis, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. We're going to see the evil that comes from the Jewish ruling council in Jerusalem we call them the Sanhedrin, and they bring Jesus in for a trial shortly following his arrest on Monday Thursday. It's under the cover of night. Uh, we get a lot of details about that trial from the Gospels, but we're looking at the passion of Christ, particularly from Luke's Gospel, his perspective on the passion. And they all weave together to give us the full story as we harmonize those Gospels. We see the unique perspectives that people have as they retell the story. Uh, but Luke, um, he shows us some, some really interesting things about the story I'll bring out in the sermon. Uh, but really what he shows us is, is this blind ignorance that accompanies the Sanhedrin as they uh, as they do their worst to Jesus. Uh, we know that justice is supposed to be blind, but I don't think that's what was meant. So we'll get into that this evening. Um, we're going to uh, begin with an opening hymn, but just one note for you. Um, watch for an email that'll come out tomorrow or Friday, and maybe a Facebook post about it too. I understand that our quilters, our Dorcas sewers, are going to have their work on display along with the work of some other uh, church groups that, uh, that sew comfort quilts. Um, at, um, at somewhere here in Vancouver. So anyway, just look for that. It should be a neat display from what I understand. I, I don't have the details in mind, but I just heard about it today. I just wanted to uh, tip you off to watch your email inboxes, especially because our emails, no doubt, will float to your spam folders and to your promotion folders. So look for them there, okay? Let's rise. We're going to continue our time with an invocation and a prayer. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. Father, we thank you for gathering us together tonight and ask your blessing on this service, that your Holy Spirit would accompany us as we encounter your word. Help us to see into the trial that Jesus went through before the Sanhedrin. Help us to see the, uh, the blind ignorance of those who accused him, and help us to see where we are ignorant and blind. Help us to have compassion on others, even as Jesus had compassion on us all from the cross. And so we ask that your spirit would lead us to the cross tonight, that we might behold our Savior and know that his gift is indeed for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's sing. Tonight's Bible reading is from the Gospel of Luke in chapters 22 and 23. Now, the men who were holding Jesus in custody were mocking him as they beat him. They also blindfolded him and kept asking him, prophesy, who is it that struck you? And they said many other things against him, blaspheming him. When day came, the assembly of the elders of the people gathered together, both chief priests and scribes, and they led him away to their council, and they said, If you are the Christ, tell us. But he said to them, If I tell you, you will not believe, 
And if I ask you, you will not answer. But from now on, the Son of Man shall be seated at the right hand of the power of God. So they all said, Are you the Son of God then? And he said to them, You say that I am. Then they said, What further testimony do we need? We have heard it ourselves from his own lips. Then the whole company of them arose and brought him before Pilate. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, you O Christ. Christ. O perfect redemption, the purchase of love, to every believer the promise of God, the vilest offender who truly believes that woman from Jesus forgiveness receives. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son, and give him the glory, great things he hath done. Please be seated. Tonight, in our study of Luke's gospel and the passion of Christ in his particular gospel, we see Jesus on trial at his hearing before the Sanhedrin, that's the Jewish ruling council in Jerusalem, and we will see by the end of tonight's sermon an encouragement that you look at a particular response, reaction to this gospel lesson in your own life. There is a natural reaction that we might want to have, and it's not a good one. It's spiritually dangerous, but I'm going to describe that to you and prompt you towards a better response. So here's what's coming in the next few minutes. There's a warning and an encouragement. But first, let's remember what we heard in Luke chapters 22 and 23. We see Jesus led away by those who arrested him, we see him blindfolded, beaten, mocked, blasphemed. We're paying attention to the passion of Christ from Luke, and Luke has a particular way of showing this part of the passion. Now, this part of the passion is actually in Matthew's gospel, in Mark's gospel, it's not in John's gospel at all, but Luke writes under inspiration of the Holy Spirit in a drastically different way than Matthew and Mark, who record the same event, different perspective, different details. The Holy Spirit inspired Luke to record these kind of details that we will explore today. First, that Luke gives this account in a simple, straightforward way. It's not long. It's actually rather short, this whole trial. So there are a lot of details that you may know about Jesus' trial before the Sanhedrin, but you didn't get them from Luke. You probably collected them from Matthew and from Mark. You might know that the high priest Caiaphas was at the trial. You might remember that he tore his robe. You might remember that there was a false testimony against Jesus, that there were witnesses who could not come to an agreement on what they were witnessing. But you didn't hear any of that from Luke. Those details come from Matthew and Mark. So let's see how the particular way of Luke replaying this trial teaches us and informs our faith. First thing to note is that Luke's account is short and simple, straightforward. He tells us that Jesus is already beaten and blindfolded before the trial ever begins. Justice is supposed to be blind. And you'd think that in this story, Jesus was the only blind man with that fabric over his face. But in fact, he is the only just man and the only one who sees straight in this whole passage. Everyone else seems to be ignorantly blind. Luke tells us that Jesus is already beaten and blindfolded before 
the trial begins. What does that tell you about the trial? Those who have put Jesus on trial know exactly where this is headed. He is already receiving the punishments for his supposed crimes. So beating him, mocking him, blaspheming against him over and over and over, they're not at all concerned with the direction that this is headed. They know where this is headed. They know the result of that night before it even shows up. There's no assumption of innocence here. Jesus is going to be condemned. Next thing we notice is that Luke has the Sanhedrin all speaking together with one voice. They have a collective voice. It's always they in this passage. They said. No lines from the high priest, no lines from the witnesses. It's just they speaking to Jesus. Verse 66, so they all said. Verse 70, they said. Verse 71, the whole company of them arose and brought him before Pilate. See, evil is speaking in a unified voice in this passage. And Jesus also speaks. He responds more than once. But when he responds to what they say to him, he doesn't really answer. He doesn't give them any more help that they're looking for. As Jesus said in the garden, this is your hour. So it's their work to do, not his. It's almost as if the Lord is is letting go, just letting evil run its course. So when they first say, if you are the Christ, tell us, Jesus responds, if I tell you, you won't believe. And if I ask you, you won't answer. They don't care what he has to say to the question. They are blindly against him already. Their mind is made up and nothing is going to change it. Then the Lord adds what could be taken as a warning or an invitation. He says, from now on, the Son of Man, I, Jesus, shall be seated at the right hand of the power of God. Do you hear warning there? Do you hear invitation? His victory, his exaltation is coming soon, very soon. So the warning is beware and repent. The invitation is believe. But Jesus' words go right past this group. They're just mining his words for something they might use in front of Pilate, the Roman governor. See, it's Roman governors in those provinces who alone had the authority to set someone up for execution. This Jewish ruling council, even though they have some authority in Jerusalem, they do not have the authority to have Jesus killed. So they have to bring Jesus before the governor, Pilate. So they speak again. So you are the son of God then? And Jesus replies, you say that I am. They speak a third time. What further testimony do we need? We have heard it ourselves from his own lips. Heard what? Heard heard what? Well, they didn't really need to hear anything from Jesus. They were so bent on destroying him that they didn't need another word from his mouth. But now they think they have enough And they're ready to take Jesus to Pilate so that, as Jesus predicted, the Gentiles can torture and crucify and kill him. They are captive to their own unbelief. They are intent. They will not turn back. So you can define unbelief in a lot of different ways. Here's one way. Unbelief is blind ignorance. Blind ignorance You see it in Luke's gospel. Back in Luke chapter 4, Jesus at the beginning of his ministry, preaching to his hometown synagogue in Nazareth. He's reading from the scroll of Isaiah, and he's describing what his ministry was all about, among other things, recovering of sight for the blind. And he meant that literally. 
He helped people recover their sight after years of blindness, their literal physical sight. And even more, he also means it in a spiritual way. He will help people recover sight from their spiritual blindness. To see God as he truly is. Gracious, loving, slow to anger, abundant in mercy. So, he restores the sight of his disciples throughout his ministry. And we see that over and over and over, the disciples still wrestle with their spiritual blindness. Unbelief is blindness. And it is arrogance. Jesus prays from the cross, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. You see, he recognizes their blind ignorance. The problem when you're both ignorant and blind is you don't even realize what's going on within you. You don't even know what you don't know. Luke has informed us in his gospel that Satan is behind all of this evil, but you wouldn't imagine the Sanhedrin knew that. I mean, are any of them thinking, well, you know, Satan is our master and we're just following along with his scheme to put the Son of God on the cross? Of course not. I mean, I guess anything's possible, but you just wouldn't imagine that they're cognizant of that at all. They are blind. They are ignorant. Jesus is the solely innocent man who goes under the corrupt judgment of blind and guilty sinners. Now, I mentioned at the beginning of the message that there's a way of reacting to this reading that you should turn away from, a response you should reject. Here it is. To ponder this account and say, how could they do that? I would never do such a thing. I would never be so blind. I'd never be so ignorant. See, that response would be pride. That response would be arrogance. They did that. I would never do such a thing. And here's why such arrogance would be dangerous for you. It's similar to the arrogance that helped blind and deceive the Sanhedrin in the first place. You see, Jesus rejected that kind of arrogance that allowed people to compare themselves with others and come out on top. Well, sure, I'm a sinner. But at least I'm not as bad as he is. <laughs> or, hey, I've made my mistakes in life. But how could they do that? Or, I thank God that I'm not sinful like all of these others. <laughs> you can't play that game if you're going to reckon with Jesus. He just won't allow it. In Luke 4, when Jesus preaches in his hometown synagogue in Nazareth, they turned on him, and they tried to kill Jesus. They took him out to the edge of town and tried to dump him off a cliff. How's that for a homecoming? And as they tried to kill Jesus, they thought, They had some special in with him, and that's what disturbed them so much. They knew who he was. Isn't this the carpenter's son, Joseph's son? I mean, they knew him. Who does he think he is now? (laughs) And so they tried to end him. But see, God shows mercy to everyone the same. He told them in that synagogue that they were no different than the Gentiles, and that also disturbed them. God shows mercy to everyone the same. He levels the playing field. No comparisons allowed. But when you took that away from them in Nazareth, 
They didn't have anything to base their righteousness on anymore because the best they could do was to compare themselves with the Gentiles. And when Jesus wouldn't let them get away with that, they tried to get rid of Jesus. Luke chapter 7, it happens again. Jesus is in the house of Simon, one of the Pharisees. And in walks a broken and literally sinful woman. And remember what she does? Out of gratitude, she anoints his feet, washes his feet with her hair. And the Pharisees, they just think Jesus is ignorant. How could he let a woman like this touch him? They're also ignorant of the fact that their own sin is just as awful as that woman's sin. And that there is no place for comparison with Jesus. So the Pharisees were not ready to admit that they were just as this woman was. That he too, that Simon also, Simon the Pharisee too, was to honor Jesus, was indebted to him, needed to be forgiven by him. And Jesus forgives her sins. And Simon and the other Pharisees could not handle it. And they plotted to have Jesus killed. So see, Jesus is destroying arrogance all over the place in his gospel. He destroys the pecking order. He cancels the comparison game. In his presence, there are no distinctions. But they hated him for it. And by nature... So would I. And so would you. See, we're no better, are we, than Simon the Pharisee, or than the Sanhedrin, or than the synagogue of Nazareth. We are no better. Remember, no comparisons. Our sinful nature is every bit as rebellious and repugnant as theirs. Your sinful nature, my sinful nature, without God's hand of grace upon us, who knows what depths we could sink to? We're just like them. So what I invite you to tonight is a godly fear. A godly fear to recognize who you are before your holy judge and to recognize that you are no better than any other sinner who's rebelled against their creator. I also invite you with that godly fear to a godly faith. A faith that looks at Jesus going to the cross and crying out, Father, forgive them, for, for they do not know what they're doing. He prays that for us as much as for those executioners and those enemies in the Sanhedrin and those disciples who fled. He prays that for us. We don't, we don't know what we're doing we walk away around half blind most of the time. But Jesus prays for us from the cross. Jesus has a compassion for us that brings him down to our level. I mean, if there's anyone in this world who could have ever gotten away with comparing himself with others, isn't it Christ? But what does he do? Does he compare? Or does he take on your cross? takes on your cross. He puts himself on the same level with you. He's executed in your place and mine. And because of that, our sin is canceled. And so is our comparison game. Because it's not just our sin that's been canceled. It's their sin too. You've got people that you can easily look at and just roll your eyes and think your thoughts and bad mouth and reject. 
But I call you tonight to that godly fear and godly faith that sees the compassion of Christ for you and for them. I call you tonight to a response to this reading that learns compassion from Jesus. I invite you to know Christ's compassion for you and to give Christ's compassion through you to others. Ask God to help you, to help show compassion through you for those who don't know, who just don't know, because they're ignorant and they're blind, and but for the grace of God, you and I wouldn't have sight either. Ask God to give you that compassion that looks at them and wants them to know the grace that God has made known to you and grow in the sense of wonder that our God, almighty, all-powerful, all-knowing, would work in the world in the way that he does. What a wonder our God is. Amen.